You're very welcome to Galway City Museum. My name is Ethna Burling and I work here at the museum. So as you know, we're going to have a workshop about archaeology and especially about an exhibition called Monument. So what we're going to do is show you parts of this exhibition as part of this workshop and hopefully then in a few weeks, hopefully not too many months, you'll be able to come into the museum and see our exhibition and all of the things that I'm going to talk to you about in this workshop. One thing I was going to tell you about at the very start is that I used to be an archaeologist a long, long time ago. I'm still an archaeologist because I'm really interested in archaeology. And archaeology is really about things from the past. It's about, it's about kind of history, but it's ancient history. And what does an archaeologist do then, you'd say? Well, an archaeologist investigates the past and investigates how people lived and where they lived, what kind of buildings they lived in, what kind of monuments that they made, what kind of objects they made and how did they make them. So we're going to look at that as part of this workshop. The first thing I want to show you is this very large map of Europe. Now the first thing you might look at that map and think, where is that? It looks familiar but I'm not really sure where it is. But if you look at it again, you'll see that Ireland, our country, is at the top of the map. You're used to looking at the map of Europe with Ireland kind of way off over to the left, over on the edge of Europe. So we decided it would be very interesting to look at a map of Europe, but in this way, so that Ireland becomes the centre of Europe. And what's interesting as well about this map is you can see the Atlantic Ocean is all the way above us. Is all and stretches all the way to the left and all the way to the right. And before we had roads and cars and lorries and trains and aeroplanes, how did people get around? Well, they got around by going across the water and across land, but they had to come to Ireland across water. So they had to build little boats. That this whole piece of the Atlantic is like a huge big motorway. It's like an Atlantic superhighway bringing you from the south part, part of Europe to the north part of Europe and out to the Iron Islands. Now we are going to show you another map. This map was made by Maeve Clancy, who you're also going to meet as part of this workshop. And Maeve is a wonderful artist and she drew this map for us and drew the beautiful picture of Dunengisa that you can see at the bottom left-hand corner of the map. Now Dunengisa is, comes from the word Dún, which means a fort. It's the Irish word for fort. So Dún Ingesa was the fort of Angus, of course. And Dún Ingesa is one of seven forts that you see on the Aran Islands. There's four on Inish Moor. Inish Moor means the biggest island because Moor, as we all know, is the Irish for big. There's two forts on Inish Man. Man means the middle, so it's the middle island. And there's one fort on Inishir, or Inishir as they say out there, and that means that is the island that is the most westerly, or the most easterly island. So apart from the seven forts, what this map shows us is a huge range of other monuments that are on the Aran Islands. And what this tells us is that there was a lot of people living on the Aran Islands for a very long time. And some of these monuments date back to the Stone Age, and then quite a few of them, including some of the forts, started off in the Bronze Age. Then they were, they were there for the Iron Age, and they were there for the early Christian or the early medieval period. So, and then you had, of course, all the churches that were built there. So you can tell from this that the people on the Iron Islands really loved their monuments, and they were very, very good at building. <laughs> look at is Dún Angusa. We talked earlier about the word Dún meaning fort, but who was Angus? Well we don't know who Angus was, but he must have been somebody very important. Otherwise he wouldn't have had such an amazing fort named after him. So the questions you'd ask about Dún Angusa, you'll see a picture of it now, is what kind of fort was it that would be built on the edge of a cliff? Was it a safe place to live? Did they have houses inside the fort? Why did they put it on the edge of a cliff? and did half of the fort fall into the water? The answer is 
probably not. Probably some of the fort fell into the water because of erosion. You know, the, the, the stone out there probably broke because of the, uh, the Atlantic and the huge waves that would have come in and all the bad weather. It was probably a, a, that kind of shape that it was, the semicircle. So you had the inner semicircle and that's where the excavations happened, uh, where the archaeologists looked at, at, at what was there. And behind that then you had another circle, and the semicircle. And then behind that again, as you can see from the photograph, there was another much wider semicircle. So these are kind of defences, is what we call them, to try and keep people out. But we're not sure that they were trying to keep people out. We think that maybe they were just trying to impress people, trying to show off, like building a huge big house in the countryside now would be the same kind of thing. And one other interesting thing they had there was called chevaux de frise, which is a French word. And that means all the stones that you'll see in the photograph, kind of like big spikes of stones, they were put outside the last defences. And again, they wouldn't have really been used, you know, to defend the fort. They would have been used more to show off, to show that they could do this and to maybe warn people, don't go messing with the people of Dunningus. So what do we know about the people who lived in Dunningus? Well, we know from the archaeological excavations that happened in Dunningsa that they started living there around 1100 BC. Now, does anybody know what BC means? Well, BC means before Christ. So that's before the year zero or the year one, if you like. So they started to live there then and they lived there all the way out to the other side to somewhere around 1100 AD, which is Anno Domino or which is after the birth of Christ. So if you put 1100 BC on one side and you put 1100 on the other side, you, you realise then that they lived on this site for probably about 2,200 years. Now what happened with the archaeologists? Well, Claire Cotter was the director of the excavation and her and her team came out. And the first thing that they did, I suppose, was that they surveyed the whole fort. And that's, they took all the measurements and they looked at what it was made of and how it was made and how it was built and looked at all that, kind of like a sci in a scientific way. And then they started to take the sod off. And the sod is just the grass or the, the kind of, you know, on the top of the fort. So they took all that off. And then they started to look at what we call the substrata. Sub means below. And the strata is like the layers. So they started to look at the underneath layers. And as they went down through the underneath layers, they started to find both uh, objects, but they also started to find the remains of houses. So what would they have used? I mean, their tools were our archaeologists' tools, which are like shovels and spades, but they also would have used trowels to clean back the, uh, the earth in a careful way after you'd use your shovel. And then after that, if they found any objects, they might have used tiny little brushes to brush around the object. And they also then, when they were doing this, they would have found out about dating. So they would have found out dates. And there's a thing called radiocarbon dating, which can tell you very closely, to being exact, the date of an object as it comes out of the ground, or the date of, um, of, of part of the monument. Another way of dating is dendro dating. Dendro means, of course, is, is trees or wood and so when you cut a tree across you probably know that the rings inside the tree will tell you how old that tree is. Now Duning, as we were just saying, dates from the late Bronze Age, so which was 1100 BC. So what did they find on the site that told them this? Well apart from the radiocarbon dates they found quite a few bronze objects on the site and in this photograph we can see how they found it in the excavation. You can see all the dirt sitting around it, these lovely little bronze rings, and you can see the measurement that they put in, which tells you what the scale of it is, so you know the size of it by putting in that little black and white measurement into the photograph. So how did they make bronze? Well, they took copper, which they might have got from a place called Alahis in, in Cork, and they took tin, which is another metal that they got from Cornwall. So it came all the way from the south of England over to the Iron Islands. And then they put the copper and the tin together into probably a clay, a little clay crucible, like a little bowl. And they hold that over the fire. That would melt. And when, the, when that was melted, it became bronze. And then you poured it into a mould, like you'd make out of plasticine. 
and when you'd have when you'd have it poured into the mold in the shape that you wanted let's say a circle or in this case those rings were kind of circles then they would clamp them together and they'd let them cool and then when it was all cooled they'd break it open and they'd have these lovely rings so what else did they find at Dunengisa? they found all sorts of things they found a bronze tweezers which is so perfectly made that you could use it still to pluck your eyebrows or to take a bit of glass out of your hand. They also found lovely amber beads and they came all the way from the Baltic. And amber resin came from there and they made them into lovely um, necklace, lovely beads and 12 of them were found. So what else did they find? Well, they also found little blue beads that might have come from Europe and they found this really lovely little ring. Well, it's like a bead that's made from a stone pebble. And I often think maybe a little child found that pebble on the beach out walking with him, his family. And he might have thought, or she might have thought, that would make a lovely bead. And so they took and they made it into a bead. And that's in the case. And we're going to have a look now at the case that has all those objects in it. And you can see the, 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 lovely, um, the lovely circles that we saw earlier, the bronze circles or the bronze rings that we saw earlier. You're going to see those all polished up and shiny now. find in the excavations. Well one thing that I also wanted to mention is they found this beautiful um, amulet and that's it's made out of a boar's tusk and it was it was used to, to, to keep them safe and to ward off evil that lovely little amulet but a boar's tusk meant that they also must have been eating boar so a boar was like a, a kind of a wild pig so they we know from the animal bones that they found on the in the excavation that they ate pig and sheep and some cattle and that kind of thing but they also ate a lot of fish ras was one fish that they liked a lot and they also let, uh, ate a lot of shellfish and then there was one one uh, particular type of shellfish that they loved which was a dog whelk and this had two purposes one was you could eat the the little fish that was inside it or the little snaily thing inside it but also inside the shell was um, a little pouch of ink and when you crushed the the shell of the dog whelk this beautiful ink pouch also got crushed and created this beautiful colour called indigo and they used that to dye their clothes along with lots of other things. Now where did they live you'd say then? What happened when it was raining for example and how did they cook their food? Well we can see some of the drawings here will tell us what their houses might have looked like. So they would have had thatched houses made probably from wattle and daub which was kind of like you know wicker walls and then they put clay on it when it was wet and it dried it to like a kind of a plaster and then in the center of the of the um, of the house you could see that they had a fire or a fire pit and they did all their cooking there and they all slept around it actually very cozy probably telling stories and looking up through the hole in the roof and um, where the smoke got out they could see the stars so it's probably actually a very nice life that they had there mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to you about is some of the other objects that we have in our exhibition and these aren't archaeological objects they're objects they're craft objects or kind of pieces of art that we asked artists to make for us for this exhibition because we wanted to find out what did artists think about when they thought about Dunengisa or the Aran Islands or the forts or the little objects in the cases what inspired them and you know yourself when you see something that really inspires you you often want to make something or draw something or somehow remember it. So these artists made lovely pieces for us so that we could have those to show you as well. And now though I'd ask you, if you want to, you can go onto our website and on our website at the museum, that's www.galwaycitymuseum.ie, it's very easy. And you go onto that website and you can have a virtual tour of monument. And if you have a look at that, you'll see all the objects and all the pieces in it. And you might like to make a picture of your own or make something out of Lego. You could make a Lego fort. You could make a plasticine fort. You could make a fort out of sticks and stones, which you'd find in the garden. Or you could just draw a really nice picture. 
And we'd be really delighted to see that. And if you felt like it, you could take a photograph and send it to us in the museum. And we could show that. So thank you very much for being with me on this tour. We hope you enjoyed it. Go and meet a man.